Thank you for joining us today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Megan Maggi. My guest today is Diane Carlson Evans. She served in Vietnam as an Army nurse working in the burn unit of the 36th Evacuation Hospital. And um, she's also gone on to um, establish the Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation. Mm -hmm. Diane, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. We're happy to have you. Um, all right, so let's begin with uh, the beginning. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Minnesota, a small rural community, a farming community, Buffalo, Minnesota. My dad was a dairy farmer and my mother was a registered nurse. Oh, okay. So you have a legacy of yeah. uh, oh, nursing yeah. in your family. Was there also a military legacy that inspired you to join the Army? or? Yes, there was. My mother graduated from nurses training in 1937 and her younger sister graduated from college, um, I think in 1940. <clears throat> and it was World War II, so her sister went into the Women's Army Corps. And she served during World War II for three or four years. When she got out, she used the GI Bill and got her doctorate degree and became a college professor. And I always looked up to her. And I thought, I'd, I'd never known a woman in, in the military outside of my aunt and she was an inspiration to me. And then of course in the 60s when the Vietnam War was beginning, um, my two older brothers, my oldest brother joined the army and then my second brother was drafted. So now I have two brothers in the army and my father was exempted from military service during World War II because he was a farmer, already had children and also worked in a munitions plant. So he was exempted from the war, but he talked a lot about his friends who served and his first cousin who was killed in World War II. So I did not grow up in a military family per se, but I grew up knowing about what happens to veterans when they come home. Um, my dad made sure each one of us kids, there were six of us, we each had a horse and we could ride. Um, on our neighbor's fields if we ask permission. But there was one neighbor my dad t talked to me about. He said, now, I don't want you over there on that farm. He's, he was in the war, World War II, and ever since he came back, he's funny. I didn't quite know what my dad meant by funny, and it wasn't disrespectful that my dad said that at all. It was just that he was different. He'd come back from World War II and he was different. So I always wondered about that. And then, of course, the death of my cousin's father. She was just an infant when her dad was killed in World War II. So there, yeah, there were things around me and my family and where I grew up that were reminders of the sacrifice of military service. Absolutely. Um, sounds like that had a, a big impact on you. Um, so, uh, you served in Vietnam after graduating from nursing school, correct? Correct. Where did you attend uh, nursing school? I went to uh, study nursing at uh, uh, St. Barnabas Hospital in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And in 1966, when my brother was drafted, I decided that if my brothers had to be in the Army, maybe I should too. And I found a nurse recruiter downtown Minneapolis and made an appointment. and. I got in her office and she was in her uniform and there was this big poster. Well, there were several posters on the walls and one of them said, it had a picture of a beautiful woman with a helmet on her head and said, the most beautiful girl in the world, the U.S. Army nurse. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. But I talked to her about, how, how can I go to Vietnam? And she said, well, when will you graduate? And I said, in 67. And she said, well, the Army has a program right now. You join now, and we will pay you a stipend. We'll pay your tuition, your books, your uniforms. And then your obligation uh, after you graduate will be two years in the Army. So I signed up that week as a junior in, co in college. Wow. So uh, you went to Vietnam in 67, 68? So in 67, I graduated, okay. and in the fall, the fall of 67, I attended the six weeks of Army basic training at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where they took all the medics, docs, and nurses to uh, go through medical training. If you were in the Army, you went through Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston training. And then from there, they assigned me to Fort Lee, Virginia for nine months, and then I was on my way to Vietnam 
late July of 1968, arriving August 1st, 68. What a time to go. Hot. <laughs> yeah. I left when it was hot, and I arrived when it was hot. Definitely. I heard that uh, that heat is, is uh, intense. It was brutal. Um, uh, tell us about your uh, experience in Vietnam. Well, that's, that's always a hard question to answer. It's uh, how do you talk about something and... How do you talk about a year's experience in five minutes or ten minutes or less? So I try to um, capture the essence of my experience in as short a snapshot as I can. And I'm a very visual person, and when I think about Vietnam, I still see Vietnam. I still see um, the people I took care of. I still see what my ward looked like. and. I also remember vi uh, physically the, the smells, the stench, the variety of smells due to the heat, and the sounds. And when I arrived, um, it was night. There was one other female on the plane with me, one other nurse. And the pilot got on the microphone and said, uh, women out first, and there were two of us. And we were met by armed guards. Now we're at Tansanoon Air Base. The plane has settled down. It's dark. And two armed guards with bandoliers of ammunition greet us at their weapons, greet us at the door as we come down the, the plane steps. And I see big holes in the tarmac everywhere because it had been hit. And they said, keep your head down. And we did. <laughs> we got on a bus. And the windows on the bus had chicken wire and were painted black to prevent any kind of shrapnel from coming in. And it was my, you know, nothing prepares you for arriving in a war zone, but arriving in a war zone. <laughs> nothing prepares you for war, but war itself. And so now this is my first step into the war, into Vietnam. And they load up the rest of the GIs who were on the plane with us in several buses and take us to wherever they took us for our first assignments. And then I got on a helicopter that was assigned just for me. I thought that was pretty cool. I went out on the helipad and there were two chopper pilots and there was the um, door gunner and me. And my assignment was the 31st, the 36th evacuation hospital in Vung Tau. And when some of my peers heard I was going to Vang Tau, they said, oh, you're so lucky, it's on the South China Sea. So supposedly it would be beautiful. Well, it was, if I had time to be out there to see it. But the 36th Evacuation Hospital was a 400-bed evacuation hospital uh, on the South China Sea. And it was, con it was Quonset huts. And each one of the Quonset huts had its own purpose, um, whether it was the recovery room or operating room or uh, medical unit for malaria and tropical diseases. My unit was surgical unit, pre-op and post-op. And I walked in and it was 105 degrees. There was no air conditioning. There was a fan, a Quonset hut. If you visualize a Quonset hut, you know what it looks like. There's a door on each end and there were fans on each door blowing the air. It was hot and these fans are blowing and every bed is full and there's 66 beds. And that's now my first day. Wow, what an introduction. Um, how, many, how many nurses were, were in uh, this unit? I remember that one of my first um, realizations was that there's only four of us four nurses, wow. and sometimes there'd be three, and occasionally there'd be two. And when I say nurses, I'm talking registered nurses, Army Nurse Corps, we are all registered nurses. Then we have had our medics who were wonderful, and um, they, did <laughs> they did everything. They did so much. So we were a small team taking care of a lot of patients. We never had enough staff, enough people to really do the quality, I think, of work we would like to have done for our patients. So it was busy. And the shifts were 12 hours, but they usually end up to be 13, maybe 14 hours. 
and then we'd go back to our lodging and sleep and then go back to work. So it was just a lot of sleeping and a lot of working. Wow. Um, getting close to the end of the first segment here. Um, so you worked in the burn unit. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sure you saw some, some intense wounds. Um, was it? The difficult thing for me about being in the burn unit, by then I'd already seen a lot of, nothing really bothered me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's, it's a war zone, you get used to seeing things. What bothered me was that it was napalm and white phosphorus and we were dropping those bombs. And so now my concept of the war and how we're fighting the war, um, dropping bombs, napalm and white phosphorus on innocent people in villages where we were trying to, you know, get them to scatter because there could be Viet Cong hiding in there, Vietnamese sympathizers. So I could see the purpose, but so many children and innocent men, women and children were badly injured. And that now is becoming aware of that and it was, I was questioning what our government was doing and why we were doing that because so many of my patients were children. So that was tough to see little kids so maimed and burned and in pain and not really being able to um, um, treat them in such a way that, that they would be normal again because they were so disfigured. Yeah, it was tough. That definitely was a, was a tough thing to deal with with the war and, and a point of contention definitely among, among Americans. Um, so uh, I'm speaking with Diane Carlson. Of the, um, she was a v Army nurse in Vietnam. In our first segment of Veterans Chronicles, we'll be right back. Thanks for joining us on Veterans Chronicles today. I'm Megan Maggi here with Diane Carlson Evans, an Army nurse in Vietnam. And we were just talking about her experience um, in the 36th evacuation hospital, the burn unit, and she was just going to tell us about her second assignment. I arrived to the 36th evacuation hospital around August 1st or 2nd, 1968. And during that time, for those of you who are historians who are studying the Vietnam War, it was a very a difficult time in America because the anti-war protests back home are really firing up. They're really heating up. And we're escalating the war and more and more troops are coming to Vietnam. And we're having a lot of mass casualties. A lot. And I had requested a transfer to go north. And uh, I had a friend, a nurse, who said later, why did you do that? It was so dangerous up there. And I said, well, I felt like if I went north I'd be going where, more where the war was. And I, I can't answer what was behind that interest of mine, but I got my wish because the chief nurse sent me to be the head nurse at the 71st Evacuation Hospital in Tu Corps up in the Highlands near the Cambodian border. And it was maybe one of the epicenters, if not the epicenter of time, at the time of the fighting. It was constant barrage of wounded coming in, and they were coming in right out of the field up there. So 71st Evacuation Hospital, uh, Pleiku, not too far from the Cambodian border. Our patients were coming to us within 10 minutes sometimes on the dust-off helicopters. So we were seeing them come in great numbers. And now it's 1969, and of course, I'm so busy and I'm so tired, and we're seeing such a huge variety of, of wounds because we have the, um, it's not just the weaponry, it's the bouncing Betty landmines. We have punji stick injuries. We have snake bites. We have all the kinds of tropical injuries and diseases that can come out of jungle warfare. Uh, and we have um, thrown in with that injured mountain yards who were injured in the crossfires of the war. And we were caring for them if they were injured because they were our allies. They were helping us. So now, now we have this indigenous population that we don't know a lot about. And the first time this young father comes in and all he's wearing is a loincloth. And he came in to see his child who had been injured and was on my unit. So now I have children in my unit along with wounded GIs. And, um, and we are now being rocketed and mortared. Our hospital is under fire. And we know all the signs now of um, incoming. You learn the sounds of it's instinctive. You have adrenaline, and it really is that fight or flight. And we were always like fighting, and we were always 
on flight. It was like we were constantly moving and listening. And if it was incoming, we knew that sound compared to if it was outgoing, because Artillery Hill wasn't very far away, and it was always loud and noisy. And then we had all these helicopters coming and going with the casualties, because our landing pad, our helipad, was just you know, out the door. So we've got all this noise and commotion and chaos, and we learned how to um, focus and set all that aside and focus on what our job was, and that was that one patient. And then we'd go from that one patient to the next, and the next, and the next. And I think when I look back on it, it's no wonder that my memories of Vietnam are also almost like it was an hallucination. Like there's, it was so chaotic, and there were so many um, memories and so many young men. How many did I care for? Hundreds, thousands. When you think of this this unit where I was head nurse in Pleiku, this was 44 beds and these were very ser seriously ill patients. And we were evacuating them out daily. We would stabilize. The purpose of the evacuation hospital was to bring in the wounded, do the triage, decide who's going to surgery first, second, third, and then bring them into our units. We'd stabilize them, do what we could to um, monitor, you know, their blood, their IVs, their chest tubes, their trach tubes, everything that was going on with them. Some of them also had malaria, so they had were spiking high fevers, and we would have to make our observations and our assessments and do the best we could for that young man. And when he was ready, out he went on the AIRIVAC chain, either in country. Uh, Vietnam to a rehabilitation hospital um, where they rehabbed them till they could go back to the field or they went on the AIRIVAC chain which could have been to Guam, Japan, um, Hawaii and back to the States so that the patient would land wherever they could care for him best. Um, I found that at Pleiku a lot of our, we had a lot of punji stick injuries and you know they would step on a punji stick which had been laced with human feces and then you'd get an immediate infection and in Vietnam everything was infected it was I just remember it just being dirty everything was dirty and an infection would kill you obviously so we were giving loads and loads of antibiotics and some some of these patients would have to be evac'd out until the infection was under control then they'd come back to their unit but it's I can give you, I told you I'm really a visual person, I can give you an example of what one, one night was like in Vietnam. All right, let's, let's get to that in our next segment, okay. just nearing the end of our um, okay. second segment. I'm uh, Megan Maggi talking with Diane Carlson Evans, an Army nurse in Vietnam. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Megan Maggi talking with Diane Carlson Evans, an Army nurse in Vietnam, and she was just telling us about one night in Vietnam and what, it, like a, you know, one experience that really stuck out with her. Diane, it was March of 1969, and there are some things about a, a traumatic war experience that you never forget. Most of it you want to forget about, and you try, and then years later it comes up in a dream or a nightmare or. Or when you age, like I am now, it becomes easier to talk about some things. So I'm going to share one vivid night in Vietnam, and it was dark, it was the monsoons, it was pouring down rain. I was working in my unit. We'd had mass casualties all week. The 4th Infantry Division had been hit really hard that month, and we were hardly ev evacuating out enough patients to make room for more beds. And the surgeons and the operating room nurses were working around the clock. I had left my unit and gone back to bed when I heard um, a gaggle of helicopters coming in. And when you hear one helicopter, it's not so bad, oh, it's a few patients. When you hear two, okay, there's two choppers coming in, what is this? But when you hear one, at, the choppers did not stop coming. And so I, I knew the phone was gonna ring and I was up and grabbed my, the phone rang, report to Ward 6, and it was the empty ward that was just kind of kept empty as a spare for mass casualties. 
and the supervisor said, go open up the ward. And I said, well, what's coming? She said, I don't know. Just go open it up. I'll send you a medic. So I grabbed, I got dressed, put my combat boots on. And so picture this. And I have now my combat boots, my fatigues. I grab my hemostat, my bandage scissor, which hangs in my jungle fatigue jacket. I've got my, the tools of my trade, the stethoscope around my neck, and my helmet. Because now the air raid is siren is also, it's a red alert. So now we're getting incoming. So every sound that I remember about Vietnam is now going on within these few seconds. I run to this unit, and the medic is there, and he said, how many are we getting? I said, I have no idea. Let's just start hanging IV bottles. So we put up IV bottles. We, we got the beds ready, and one by one by one by one they came in. The reason I have such an accurate recollection of what I'm going to tell you is that I had written home about it afterwards. And I told my mom and dad what had happened and that 27 men had been admitted in my unit that night. With, and I had one medic. And it was dark. The, fl the lights were out because they had to be out at night for protection. And he ha we had a flashlight. And I started with the first, I, I called them boys, they were so young, so I'll say boy. I started with the first boy, and I could determine, as these guys were coming in, I didn't see any blood, I didn't see any injuries, I didn't see any wounded. It's like, what is, what, what is, what are with these guys? I don't see any injuries, nobody's bleeding. But his veins were so collapsed, and his skin was so dry and dirty, um, that I could hardly find a vein because of collapsed veins, which told me, one, he's dehydrated. He's been out there for days. How long has he been out there? He hasn't had anything to eat or drink. He's, he's in shock, and he has low blood pressure, a barely audible pulse. His respirations are depressed. This kid is going to die if we don't get some fluids into him. So I, t I tell the medic, just stand there and hold that flashlight until I get that, and I got the IV started. And then I went, I started 27 IVs that night on all those boys. And that was the first thing I had to do. I couldn't do anything else but just get IV started because they were, and every one of these young men were the same. And they smelled bad. There was vomit. There was jungle rot. There was, they, and they were barely talking because they were all, not only were they in, the, in a state of, uh, physical shock from lack of um, hydration, uh, but they were in an emotion. I could see they were in an emotional state of shock. Um, you've probably heard of the thousand yard stare. They all had it. They all just sort of like laid in their beds and barely looked at me. And and I tried to reassure each one of them by saying, "You're safe now. <laughs> You're safe." As the air raid sirens are, and I, you're hearing incoming come in. It is not safe. <laughs> But I had to give them some sense of safety. You're in a hospital now. You're, you're going to be OK. We're going to take care of you. You're safe now. And so, um, so if you can picture this scenario, it's like surreal. It's like a hallucination. And I remember the chaos when they started coming in. And then this medic said to me, um, as we we're finishing up, he said, Lieutenant, did you ever notice that when American nurses are on the ward that the guys calm down? And I just looked at him and I said, no. And he said, no, it's true. Having you women here, having you nurses here, you don't know what that means to these patients, to these guys. They feel, and of course this isn't anything against male nurses, but um, and of course, we didn't have a lot of male nurses at the time. That has increased, thankfully, uh, with over the decades of men integrating the nursing field. Um, but the the patients did feel uh, a sense of home or security. We it's like we women, we nurses, we were young ourselves, but we became their mothers, their sisters. They felt some sort of safety or security having us there with them. But so 
it, it, it seemed like in Vietnam, I was 22, I had my 22nd birthday, I'm head nurse in this surgical unit and now called to open up this other unit, but as I reflected on that night, I thought, that medic and me, those guys, we were all they were going to get. We were it. And it depended on how brave we were and how smart we were and how quick we were and how um, astute we were to everything going on around us. And then it wasn't that night. I think it was the following night. We had in the incoming. We really did have rockets in our hospital and shrapnel, and we were hit. And they were always aiming for the radar, which was right next to the hospital. And I grabbed the mattresses to cover those young men who couldn't get under their beds because they were hooked up to IVs and blood and trachs and chest tubes. So you could not get them under their bed because you'd yank out all their tubing and you didn't want to do that. So you'd, but everybody else that could just have like our IV poles, we had long IV lines, they could just get under the bed and that was their bunker, if you will. And then I grabbed a mattress wanting to throw it on the little four-year-old Montagnard girl who had had circumferential burns and her parents had been killed when their village was bombed and she was screaming. So now I have this little girl screaming in terror because the incoming and she is remembering when, of course, her village was bombed and her parents were killed. She is screaming at the top of her lungs. And I realize I can't protect her. I can't put a mattress on her because of her burns. So she's in a crib. They actually had cribs, for the, had shipped cribs to Vietnam so we could take care of these kids. So she's in this crib. And I remember just taking her hand and holding it while I crawled under her crib. And that was after I made sure all the guys were safe. So I want you to think about what I just said. The nurses took care of the men first. We women were protecting the men. We weren't wilting violets, like running away to protect ourselves. <laughs> like some people like to think about, oh, women can't be in combat. They would, the men would just be there to protect them. Well, we women were in Vietnam to protect the men. We were there to save their lives, and we would have given our life for them. And we were the last ones to go to the bunker. We were the last ones to crawl under the bed and take care of ourselves. Our patients came first. And those Vietnamese children and the Vietnamese people who were our patients, they also came first. And that's an important thing for people to understand and recognize because later, when we started sending women to Iraq and Afghanistan, it was like, oh, this is the first time women have ever been in combat. And, and how, how will they measure up? Because you know, th they certainly can't be brave enough or strong enough. And I'm thinking, go back in history and read about the women who have served forever, who have lost their lives and who were there mostly as nurses to save lives. So with that, I think that kind of gives you a little glimpse into we were in very unsafe areas. There were no front lines and back lines. We were, all of Vietnam was a danger zone. The whole country was a front line. And we women were there. And we didn't run away from it. We, we, we were a part of it. And we did all that we could to um, do our job like we had been trained to do and more. The sheer fact that your hospital was under fire proves that you were also in combat and you were doing just as much to put your life on the line, like you said. So absolutely, you know, modern military is not the first time that, that women have been in combat, as you illustrated. That's a, wow, that's an amazing story, um, which uh, leads me into my next question. You know, serving mm -hmm. as, a, as a woman in the Army in the late 60s, early 70s was definitely an interesting time in terms of fem feminism. And I think it was 67 that Johnson had passed um, the law prohibiting uh, women from advancing promotions within the um, military, is that correct? Um, wh what was it like to, to be experiencing that? Did you um, experience any setbacks as a woman, or um, what was that experience like? I think uh, the experiences of the nurses might be a little different, because if you mm -hmm. would interview uh, women who were in the Women's Army Corps, who were segregated from the men, they had their own corps, Women's Army Corps, and of course now they're integrated. Mm -hmm. The Army Nurse Corps, uh, we were all nurses. 
And we had a mission and we had a purpose and we had all been to college and had our degrees. And so we were part of a big team with the doctors and the medics. So we were a core group and had a very clear mission. And to Vietnam, if you weren't a nurse, your chance of going to Vietnam was very low. It's estimated about 88% of us were nurses the total female military population in Vietnam were nurses. And there were maybe 650 WACs, and there were some WAFs, and there were some WAVs. But primarily, we were Army nurses, and we went with a very clear mission. And I think that helped that we also had rank. We were all officers. So uh, I think that, I don't know how I mean that that helped, but that we had a position of responsibility and we knew what, what our responsibility was. And we were among colleagues, among peers. So when we were outside of that box, for example, in Vietnam, we nurses were told we were not allowed to go on convoys. Convoys were on the ground, they were military trucks going places with supplies, convoys, mm -hmm. or jeeps, three quarter, what have you, and that it would be very dangerous. And I always wondered, did they think it would be dangerous because we'd be out there with all those cute guys, those cute GIs, you know, 18, 19 year olds? Or was it to protect us from being out in what they would consider more of a combat role? Or then, I, of course, I came to realize convoys were very dangerous because that's where the danger was. And, you know, they would be attacked from a variety of ways. So we would fly by helicopters. So everywhere we went, supposedly, but was by chopper. And so we got to know the dust off pilots. But I felt like I just had so much respect for my medics, for those helicopter pilots, for the doctors I worked with, the nurses I worked with. I just felt that we were this core group of people who were in Vietnam. Many of them didn't want to be there, but we were there to conserve the fighting strength. That was the medical core mission, preserve the fighting strength. And so I felt a part of something really big and really important. And I think when you're in a war zone, you need to feel that. But it started to unravel. When, when I looked at these young GIs, well, and they weren't all young, they were all ages. We had World War II veterans, Korean veterans, who had served in two wars already, and now they're wounded again the third time, their third service. But the unraveling for me started when I, when I realized what was happening at home and that the, the support for the war, there wasn't any. There was no support for the war. Then we were learning that there was no support for us either. And that was, um, the, the, they talk now about the moral injury of war. So, so people considered the war immoral but that didn't make us immoral. We were just doing what our country asked us to do. Now it's like the, the immorality that they're thinking about, the war is immoral, it's wrong, we shouldn't be there. Um, but we're not immoral, we're in uniform. We are serving our country like the veterans of all previous soldiers. Why can't we be as proud? Why aren't we honorable? And then we come home and we are dishonored by our American citizens because of our service in Vietnam. So that became very conflicting, very frustrating, very confusing, and created a whole host of emotional anxiety that I think created extreme stress and resulted in a lot of PTSD for a lot of us. Coming home and experiencing that, um, and also, you know, having served with an amazing group of women, I know you mentioned earlier you really lo appreciated your team and, and the, just everyone that you served with. Um, th I'm sure that served as a motivation to establish the um, Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the process of that and how it's evolved? Absolutely. Um, there was a backstory to us women in Vietnam because I just told you how how proud I was of the team I worked with. And then there are those times that you're not proud of because you know of the person who raped your roommate. You know of the person who assaulted or sexually harassed another nurse. Um, it did happen, and there were abortions. And 
due to rape, sexual assault, some of it had been due to drugs, alcohol, the whole gamut that happens. Anything that happens in the civilian world is going to happen in the, in the military world. At the time for us women, and remember the total military force at the time was only 1% women. So I was less than 1% of the total military as a woman. So we are on display. And we learned to watch our back. We learned to be careful. But there were also these, just these great men who would have protect, who watched out for us. They were good guys. And I, I, I think of, you know, a lot of the men that I served with that were just really wonderful human beings. But then there's that 5% or whatever's out there. And so these women were very hurt and came home with a lot of pain. And not only that pain, but then the pain of realizing that our country didn't even know we were there and what we went through. Not only did they not know about our contribution and what we had done in Vietnam as nurses and other women who were there, of how we had saved lives and offered and really sacrificed and paid a heavy price, but they also didn't recognize what had happened to some of these women and that they needed to heal, they needed some help from the VA, they needed reconciliation, they needed benefits, um, they needed physical, uh, they needed holistic care, to, to put it in a nutshell, just as the men did, but they weren't getting it. And I, did, I didn't come to terms with that until 1982 when the wall was dedicated in Washington, D.C. And I told my husband, I said, they're going to dedicate a memorial. I, I was like in shock. It was like, they're really going to honor Vietnam veterans? Well, they were going to remember the dead. And thank goodness. And when I learned that the names would be on the wall, that's when I told my husband, I have to go and I have to find some names. But I have to do this alone. I went to Vietnam alone. I came home alone. I'm going to do this alone. So now you're kind of getting this glimpse into one person that, as a woman, we had to suck it up and do things alone. Remember when I said it, it so much seemed like on our shoulders in Vietnam? We didn't have enough staff. We didn't have enough supplies. We weren't experienced. We were young. But yet, if that patient died, it was on our watch we would blame ourselves. It was like, I'm on my own here. I better measure up. I better step up and do the best I can. And now we have a memorial, finally, that's going to remember all those men and women who died in Vietnam. And I found Sharon Lane's name, who died, who was killed in Vietnam when I was there. And I found Eddie Lee Evanson, who I had cared for. And all it took was finding those two names, and I stood there and I burst into tears, and I had never cried over Vietnam. And I burst into tears for the first time, and then I could not stop crying. And then I think that something was building up inside of me. There was a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of memories coming back. And now I think deep-seated anger, anger at how the nation had treated Vietnam veterans. I had witnessed how these young men had suffered and died, all these names on the wall. I had witnessed that, and yet our country was diminishing our service. They were denigrating our service. They were treating us um, like we were not honorable. We couldn't be proud of our uniforms. We, sh we couldn't even wear our uniforms. We might get spit on. <laughs> there was so much hostility directed to us, and all I kept asking was why. And then the women. So now I'm thinking about these women that were my hooch mates, the women that I worked with. You have to back up and realize now that I stayed in the military till 1972. So all those years, stateside, I'm also caring for wounded soldiers coming back from Vietnam and working with all these wonderful women who were stateside. And I thought, now they're going to dedicate another statue another memorial, because they dedicated the wall. But there was a lot of controversy to the wall. And to satisfy the other faction of veterans who wanted something more heroic and a bronze figurative portrayal, they decided upon a sculpture 
of three men uh, and commissioned Frederick Hart, and it was dedicated in 1984. So now, 1982 to 1984, all I can think about is where are the women? Where are the women? I, no, where are they? Nobody knows about them. I lost track of them. And I thought, well, if we're going to put a statue up that looks like men, we need a statue that looks like women so the country knows women were there as well. And women were one of the most important contingents of that entire war. When you think of our, maybe our numbers weren't great. Three million men served in Vietnam and only 10 or 11,000 women. But think of the contribution of these women. Day in and day out, for how many years were we there? Every day, all day long, um, what we were doing in a variety of roles. And so I told my husband, I'll never forget this, we had four kids under the age of 10. And I had a part-time job. I was very busy. And I told Mike, who's also a veteran, I said, honey, I said, if we're going to have a statue there of men, there has to be one to women, because otherwise the country will never know about the women. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but i, I got to do something. And he said, well, who would be against that? That's motherhood and apple pie. Who would be against the women who served? And I felt the same way, but that was my naivete. I still didn't understand the, um, the culture and generation that we actually lived in. And, it's, and in a politically, militarily, um, but I decided what I needed to do first was kind of educate people as to who we were. And then I found some lawyers <laughs> and asked, how do we start a nonprofit to raise money? How, uh, we need a board of directors. We need an IRS status. We need an articles of incorporation. We need to become a charity to raise funds. We need publicity. We need money. And one thing I'm good at after Vietnam and growing up on the farm where there were six kids and we, we were all work, we all worked on the farm. It was work. I'm, I, I love to work. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of work. And I'm not afraid of a challenge. And I said to myself, if I could do what I did in Vietnam, I can do this. I can slay those dragons. I can fight those battles because I know that what I'm doing is the right thing. And in 1993, we dedicated the Vietnam Women's Memorial because myself and all the people now who believed in it, we didn't give up. Just like in Vietnam, we never gave up on a patient, and I wasn't going to give up on the memorial. That must be such an amazing feeling to see it still going today, and you know, you were able to fight multiple battles uh, yeah. with your experiences. Um, fortunately, we're out of time. Um, Thank you for joining us today. My guest was uh, D Diane Carlson Evans, an Army nurse in Vietnam and also the founder of the Women's, uh, the Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation. I'm Megan Maggi. Thank you for joining us on Veterans Chronicles.